you have already seen the image with the Stavaurios hiding in the macrophage macrole, and now we'll hear a talk about how to possibly approach such a, a bacteria that hide in, in cells with new therapeutic avenues. We are happy to hear the talk of, of Professor Inge Hermann from ETH Zurich. All right. So welcome to this presentation. I'm going to be touching a lot of aspects that have been discussed before and beautifully introduced by actually previous speakers. I believe that most of the topics already have been introduced. What I will be talking about today, or rather discussing with you, is inorganic antibiotics. And what I mean with that is not silver and not zinc. Um, so I am an engineer by training. Biology is very complex for me. So I just simplify it in my mind by a lot. And I think in very, very simple ways. And so what I aspired to do with my research team a few years ago is we wanted to develop a nanoparticle-based glue that could actually support the different ways, phases of the wound healing process. So we started with a very ideal, idealized plot. Um, different phases of wound healing as we know them from textbooks. And we designed a particle, inorganic particle, that will help us support these phases in a temporally orchestrated way. We imagine that by having a core shell architecture with a shell that will inter interact with the blood coagulation system, adhere to tissue, then gradually dissolve, release ions, and reveal a core that would then take additional function, such as anti-inflammatory activity or antimicrobial activity. It all sounds very simple, right? It's not. So we, we went on to actually create these particles um, in a very, very simple synthesis process, we profited a lot from what is known in the literature. There are many different inorganic materials that have well-described functions, and this is something what we could profit on. So we took some of these materials that exhibited the functions that we liked most, um, and by, we identified bioglass and cerium oxide as two compounds that are particularly promising because they give us adhesive properties, hemostatic properties, immunomodulating properties, and antimicrobial properties. We synthesize particles based on this material in a flame spray spin this process. It's a simple, one-step, continuous process that allows us to create different architectures in a continuous manner. It's very versatile, it's reproducible, and it's sterile. So as a result, we can get hybrid particles with different architectures, such as a cereal core and a bioglass shell, or we can have more mixed materials, and we can tweak it by base, based on the synthesis conditions. We went on to look at these particles in biological systems, and first we confirmed that they would adhere to tissue. This is something that we wanted to have because we imagined this to sort of function as a tissue glue. We confirmed that these particles would also stop um, the bleeding. I think I have no laser pointer, but nonetheless. So basically in a middle plot, you can see how you achieve rapid blood coagulation, which is wanted in a wound healing scenario, I guess, by adding these particles. And then on the right-hand side, I think you see the most important graph. By using Syria as a component in these particles, you can actually get very interesting functions. Cerium oxide functions as a sort of nanozyme. It catalytically mimics the functions of natural enzymes. And this is incredibly powerful because it allows us to protect cells from hydrogen peroxide or oxidative stress. And so you can actually see that in our control experiments, the hydrogen pyroxide dose completely kills the entire cell population. But by adding par these particles, we can rescue some of the cells. This at the same time also shows that these particles have quite decent mammalian cell compatibility. We also confirmed that actually these particles can act as antimicrobials. And here's a very simple experiment, and I put, apologize to all the uh, bacteria experts. Um, so this is just a planktonic assay where we look at the biomass, the function of time, and we compared for these different cereal particles to sink. And we can see that if we have a high cerium-3 concentration on our particle surface, we actually get a very comparable activity to sink oxide. Uh, at, uh, at the comparable concentration. 
So now this brings me to the point that was actually beautifully introduced by Professor Buman, and for once I don't have to explain that bacteria can actually live within cells or hide within cells. And this is actually exactly the problem that we wanted to tackle with these particles. So uh, bacteria can hide within cells, uh, amongst other cells also macrophages or monocyte-derived macrophages. Many antibiotics can reach them well. And so we thought that if we create nanoparticles that sort of have similar properties to these bacteria in terms of charge and maybe also clusters with a similar size, we could maybe target them to the cell, cell, subcellular cell compartment. And it's exactly what we did with these particles. So we fed these particles a suspension to human monocyte-derived macrophages with the hypothesis that these particles would colicolize with bacteria and kill them. This is how it looks under a transmission electron microscopy image. It's zoomed in version of bacteria, in this case, staph, hiding within human monocyte-derived macrophages. And you can see that these bacteria, in some cases, have intact membranes, so you can see a sort of bright outer membrane. However, when particles are next to these bacteria, you can see how the, the membranes uh, are damaged and the bacteria are dead. We can also quantify that, and we can see a log two reduction of extracellular bacteria and a 60% or over 60% reduction of intracellular bacteria. Um, of course, we were interested what this means if we apply this to more complex system. So, what we performed next was we performed a proteomics analysis on the part on the proteins that was absorbed on our particle surfaces once immersed in human body fluids, such as serum or serum fluid. And we looked at the particles also in comparison to different other metal oxides. What we can nicely see from this PCA analysis is that actually the particles cluster very well. So for example, if we have bioglass and serum bioglass, we form a cluster and they absorb similar proteins uh, that are very distinct from proteins that absorb on other metal oxides, such as titania or hafnia. What we can also see, and I guess for many of you this is not unexpected, we can see that there is a complement factor enrichment on the surface of these particles, which actually likely targets them very effectively to macrophages. This is something that we wanted to confirm, so we applied this nanoparticle-based suspension, or nanoglue, to a model uh, in a rat, that's a seroma model, so seroma is a cavity that forms in serous fluid leaves, uh, from a surgical wound, for example, and it's actually a pretty painful uh, condition. So we applied this nanoparticle glue to actually glue together the seroma cavity. And so the first result that's important to see here is actually uh, we get really, really beautiful seroma incidence reduction. We completely uh, cure the seromas with 100% efficiency, which is much more efficient than fibrin glue. At the same time, we don't see toxicity. We don't see distribution of the applied nanoparticles to other organs, so particles really stay in place. And I'm sorry for the surgical image coming, but you can also see a beautiful adhesion in the image that's framed uh, on the rate. So particles really also lead to improved adhesion. What we can also see here is that particles like, nicely target the macrophages. Uh, so we correlate histology, um, large areas, super large areas, with uh, electron microscopy, also large areas, and then we, s we assess colocalization of particles with uh, CD68 positive cells, for example, and we can see that over 95% of the nanoparticles really accumulate in the macrophages, indicating that this might actually also potentially work in the future. So for the seroma case, we see a following mechanism of action of this nanoparticle-based glue. Um, so it has all kinds of different properties and it unifies them quite nicely. So on the one hand side, it stops the inflow of the serous, serous fluid into the cavity. Um, it reduces the death space by creating adhesions between the two sides of the serous, ser seroma cavity. And it prevents infections by the mechanism that I just showed you, um, which is actually based on ROS. We further looked at whether this also works in a more generalized model. We applied the same nanoparticle-based glue on a skin flap um, transplant model in a, in a mouse. Uh, we can actually see that um, this glue also enhances the blood flow in the flap 
uh, and the survival of the flap. Um, it performs very comparable in a tube and a tilio tube formation assay, uh, very comparable to VHF. And we can actually also further track these particles, and again by a different analytical method such as XRF or Raman spectrum microscopy, confirm that these particles really end up in the macrophages. So there is a lot of analysis behind this. Uh, images, but basically what is results in is that we can correlate the serum uh, signature to signatures of lipids that are characteristic for macrophages in these tissues. What we can also see is how these particles actually change once they are in the tissue, and we can look uh, at the Raman signatures of these particles. What we can see is that, for example, the bioglass component, depending on the particle act uh, ac architecture, can either mineralize or not mineralize, which makes these particles tailored to either soft or hard tissue integration. Um, so basically, because um, we can tailor these properties so nicely to the tissue that we want to target, we thought that it would be interesting to also see if this nanoparticle-based glues can address the problem of implant loosening or implant infections. So we apply these particles in two different versions. One uh, version that uh, has the mineralizing version interfacing with the bone, and the other version that has a non-mineralizing version of the particles interfacing with the gum. And so uh, we would, in this way, by applying these coatings, we could potentially fix this delicate issue of uh, implant infections and implant loosening. What is nice about our flame spray process is that we can actually directly coat implant surfaces in a single step. Instead of collecting the particles from the flame on a glass fiber filter, we can actually directly spray them on implants and in this way create functional surfaces. I'm just going to quickly show um, the antimicrobial performance. Um, we looked at the CFU counts in this case of um, uh, bacteria uh, for um, non-coated discs and also the commercial implants, and uh, we could see a really, really drastic reduction achieved by the coatings. So with this, I'd like to come to the summary of my talk, and I would also like to uh, put out a bit of a hypothesis, uh, maybe to discuss later. Um, what I'm hoping to achieve with this project is that maybe we can create nanoparticles that can sort of give our macrophages superpowers. So by including these particles into macrophages, they actually behave very nicely because of the Syria component. Syria is very, very friendly with mammalian cells, but at the same time, it's unfriendly with microbes. And this is because it's so sensitive to the, the cellular microenvironment. And this is something that we'd like to uh, capitalize on in future. At the same time, it also these hybrid particles give us uh, tissue bonding properties, properties that are friendly for the wound healing in general, and uh, this is something that we are pursuing in the future. With this, I'd like to thank my team, uh, wonderful postdocs and doctoral students that worked on this, uh, collaborators, especially the Consonant Dinesco group in Bern funding, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for these innovative and stimulating ideas. Have you already thought about if such a product can find a place in the product world as we have heard before? Yes, uh, absolutely. It's actually one of our major pain points. Um, so generally, if we talk or if I talk about inorganic nanoparticles in this particular field, I can see the eyes of people going wide and like toxicity in their eyes in their face, you know, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, and then it's also like the delivery aspect, I guess is a bit counterintuitive. Um, we think that we can really reach uh, interesting target cells, but of course um, this is limited um, to these kind of uh, situations that Professor Buman, for example, showed. It's much harder for implants. Um, so investors at the moment are not jumping on it. Maybe in five years, <laughs> we're hopeful. Um, I have two questions. One is the big toxicity one. D um, where do you know that, uh, or uh, d do these nanoparticles leave the body again? Yes or no? And the second question was, besides the antibacterial activity, do you see also antifungal 
activity? It's a very good question. Um, I, I think that the degradation kinetics are very slow. So they will not be excreted very quickly. Um, which is a thing that's important to address. Um, personally, I'm not sure if this is a bug of, or a feature, but I understand that's a very arguable um, uh, uh, um, thing to say. So the, because of a Syria that's quite stable, I don't expect them to degrade them in weeks. Maybe if we're lucky in months or half a year. Um, yes, the antifungal properties, we tested them, I think, against one fungus, and it worked, but it's definitely something that we are actually doing at the moment in, with a certified lab in Australia. So we're looking at what kind of strains and pathogens we are actually able to kill in very standardized assays. So hopefully, hopefully I'll have the answer in a month or so.